podcast. News and inspiration from and for startup, social enterprise and charity founders. We help you make a difference. This edition of Social Good Podcast features Christy Porter from Signify Solutions. Christy helps small non-profits and for-profits with a social mission get noticed and grow through effective marketing and communications. Her description of herself is creator, writer, Christian, activist, dreamer, traveler, solopreneur, INFJ, and champion of non-profits and social enterprises as chief do-gooder at Signify Solutions. As usual, all the links are in the show notes. Please review the show on iTunes or wherever you hear it, or just email or leave me a message at socialgoodpodcast.com. As usual, I ask Christy to tell me her story. Hi, Reese. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I am Christy Porter. I am the founder of Signify. Um, And we help nonprofits and social enterprises get noticed and grow through effective marketing and communication. So that's kind of the formal spiel. Um, But what that really breaks down to, if you're not familiar with a lot of those words, is that I help cause-focused organizations look and sound more professional so that they can increase their sales and donations and uh, get their mission out there. What what attracted you to that field? What, What did you do before? Um, I've been in the marketing, PR, advertising, kind of mass communications background. Well, that was my major in college. And then I've sort of worked in and out of different organizations utilizing either um, PR or marketing or, but kind of combining them all together with a focus in one at different jobs. And so that was sort of a skill set that I'd already had. And then in 2006 is really when I became aware of the social justice movement and really wanted to start playing in that space. I'd been around nonprofits all my life um, just because my family uh, served and volunteered in our church and was aware of a lot of people doing great things in our community. So that kind of, that was an easy, I understood it. I loved that they were helping people that maybe couldn't help themselves. Um, And then in 2006, when I became aware of the social justice movement, it sort of added a whole movement and phrase to things that were already in my heart. And so I just sort of, I started with the anti-trafficking community and human trafficking is really a big issue that's near and dear to me. So I started there and sort of became aware of other different types of social justice organizations and volunteering and helping them going to their events, that kind of thing. And so I just really wanted to play more in that space. Um, And then my last, previously to starting Signify, I'd worked at an environmental nonprofit um, that was a grant giving organization and then just most recently was at a um, Christian event and curriculum company, and it was a nonprofit as well. So whenever I was the event marketing director there, I knew I was ready to move on to something else, felt like I'd done what I could do, and was looking for those next steps. And really what had already been around me was I had friends that had little nonprofits and social enterprises, and they would continually asked me marketing and communications questions and so of course I was happy to answer because they needed help and they're my friends and you know that it was easy it was my background whereas it was something a lot of them weren't trained in um, so then once I started looking for the next avenue I like probably a lot of people was looking at job boards or on email lists or websites or something like that and just didn't find anything that really spoke to me and I thought well I could go into one organization and I could do a lot of good there as I have in the past, or I can think about my friends and 
start really my own company where I can help a bunch of these little guys who would never be able to afford somebody like me on staff full time, but have these little marketing issues that I could pop in and help out with projects or help them promote their events or something that was more on a project basis that was more affordable to them and they could learn from me um, to be able to do it better next time and help move their mission a little further down the line. So that was kind of the direction I went and it's been fun so far. Great. How long, how long have you been independent? Um, July 2016 was my official launch. So we're coming up to two years. Yes. How's it going? Some days it feels like two days. Some days it feels like 20 years. <laughs> it is the rise of the entrepreneur, I think, always with the ups and downs. What, uh, just for the benefit of listeners and, and the viewer, um, mm -hmm. whereabouts in the States are you based? Atlanta, Georgia, the hub of the Southeast. Southeast. So it's probably very warm. It is. We, Atlanta is affectionately and sometimes not affectionately known as hot Atlanta. <laughs> Yeah, summers can be brutal. <laughs> and and you've that's your community and you've been there since, since two thousand one. Cool. Yeah. Uh, it was I originally am from Texas, um, but was looking for someplace else and my best friend's parents lived out here and so after college they said, Come try Atlanta and so I've been out here and it's been great and it's an amazing community for people in general, but also the entrepreneur, the anti trafficking, social justice and the um, cause boat based community. What's the best thing about, sorry, describe to me your ideal client. Sure. My um, ideal client would be nonprofits or social enterprises. So both the for and nonprofit side of uh, do good mission oriented spaces, social impact spaces. What do people, what's their biggest headache? Um, I think a lot of it, it, well, a lot of them come to me and say, you know, I need to work on marketing. I know I need to be doing marketing, but I don't have time. Or, you know, we only have a couple staff members or we have a small staff and marketing is one of the other responsibilities of this person, but it just never gets done. And so the first thing that they have to realize is they are marketing, whether they realize it or not. So we can come in and put some strategy around that, but it's already happening in some way. And so I want them to just be more purposeful. And so I like working with small organizations and I like helping them find what will work for them. I'm not going to come in and say, you need to do, you know, 10 Twitter posts a day. You need to be on Facebook this much. You need to do, you know, and lay out all this stuff that's going to be overwhelming. And while those are great and those are ideal, it's probably not manageable for them. So I can help them figure out what is what is going to work with their time and schedule and their responsibilities. We start from there. And usually that comes with something, an immediate need. Like we have an event coming up. We have a product launch where we need to redo our website. You know, kind of those common things is, is usually where they come to me. They have a very specific need in mind with um, something right in front of their face that they can see. And so then I am able to use that not only to help whatever that need is, but to help them say, okay, this is what it is in light of your entire marketing strategy. Because, if everything you do is a one-off, let me just do this one event and get it over with. Let me just do this website launch and get it over with. Then you're really not serving your, your organization or your audience any justice. So, the, um, therefore, the relationship develops, presume, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yes, yes. I am probably, I love, you know, I, I love scheduling time with my clients. And the great thing is, um, the really wonderful thing is I started my business and for the first year I just worked with friends. So there's really no better way to start your business is by helping people that you already love and care about and want to see them do really well. So from there it started being referrals and I started meeting people at events and things like that. But yeah, the great thing is that I am happy to say that a lot of my clients, I can not only call them clients, but I can call them friends. That's brilliant. And, and you get to choose who you work for on that basis. Yeah. So you've been going coming up to two years. Um, mm -hmm. Is it feast or famine or has it been steady growth? Um, it is. It's definitely ups and downs because especially if I work with nonprofits, they have a lot of year-end giving or even the for-profits. There's a lot of those year-end sales with the holidays. So first quarter is usually pretty quiet. People are kind of regathering and regrouping for um, spring. So then April, May, sometimes June are really busy. So you know, I try and use the time, for example, early on in the year, 
if I've just had um, a good fourth quarter because people were trying to get sales and donations in, then I'm able to have more of my own free time to either do networking or to get my own systems and house in order, that kind of thing. So there's certainly never a shortage to do. <laughs> Great. Can I just clarify, because most of my listeners are UK listeners. Oh, yeah. when, you, when you say final quarter, what time of the calendar year is that? October, November, December. That's, That's fourth cool. quarter here. That's cool. You you do it the sensible way. We tend to have well, except for nonprofits, quite a few charities have uh, the calendar year as their year end, but yeah. the tax year, the inland revenue year, um, we we do um, the fifth of April. I oh yeah. Ours is in April. We just don't run necessarily business quarters that way. Right. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. So, what's the fa- what's the best bit about b- b- doing what you're doing? Um, I mean, the best part is just helping these people get their message out. We all know, you know, there are amazing, very large corporations: Habitat for Humanity, Tom Shoes, Charity Water. Um, Warby Parker, if you're familiar with any of those guys, um, they're um, big, huge, amazing organizations, and they're great at what they're doing, and they have a lot of manpower behind it. But we also know people, friends, family, acquaintances, whatever, that are doing great local community work that just need help getting their message out there. So I love being able to support these small organizations that are doing incredible things that maybe not everybody has heard of. And so you know, kind of one of the phrases I use over and over again is um, by helping organizations like this, when they succeed, we all win because they're all trying to do something that's going to improve the world. So from my standpoint, why wouldn't I want to do what I have the skill set to do to help them do what they do better? Do you find people maybe not in the states but i come across people who who sometimes say oh so and so is already doing that there's no point in me getting involved what do you say to them i think there definitely is a time when you should if you're trying to launch something as a new organization you need to do your research to see who else is out there because there might it might serve you better with your own time skills um abilities schedule that kind of thing to join with somebody else however You know, the thing it comes across in marketing, but it comes across just in people telling their own stories. The thing that makes you different is you. So I can have, I can work with six different anti-trafficking organizations or six different homeless shelters or something like that. And they're all doing it a little differently. They all have their own spin on why they started. And as long as that is coming through, that's what makes them unique because really every person um, can pretty much be doing more, whether it's physical serving an organization, just going in and helping them file and keep organized or actually being out on the streets with them or helping in their marketing and communications or whatever it is, donating money, of course. We seem to always put the bulk of everything in, in the money pile, which is great. And organizations, both for and nonprofit, will always need more of that. But there's so much else we can offer. There's so many more resources we can share. And so it's trying to figure out where you can plug into an organization that's doing good. And if you're starting an organization, then no one can take your story from you. That's what makes you unique. So if you feel like you need to be out there doing your own thing and this is how you're going to make it different, then highlight that difference because that's what will draw people to you. When organizations, we're very keen on this in the UK, we want to measure impact. Mm -hmm. How do you measure impact or do you measure impact? Depends who you're beholden to, whether it's a board, a shareholders, any of that kind of thing, what they're going to be looking for. Um, The point I think though is measuring something. So even if it's, if you have email campaign going out for donations, if you have an event you need attendance for, You need some sort of metric to make sure to see where that will be a success in your eyes or not. I can't necessarily tell you, you know, your event needs to draw this many people. You know, you may say it needs to draw this many people due to the budget to clear costs, all of that stuff. And that's great. But you've got to have something to measure it on. And I think um, especially in small organizations, there's they feel so much pressure to we have to do X, Y and Z, whether it's be on social media or throw an annual gala or do an annual fundraising campaign or create new products to sell any of that. And 
and those are all great, but they should have a strategy behind them so that you can tell where the win is. And that's really the point is, you know, I don't know every single scenario out there to say this should be your goal. I do know you should have a goal. Um, because otherwise, if you're just doing it for the sake of it, then again, you're not really serving yourself well. And if there's no strategy behind it, especially for, for example, one thing I often see as a downfall in events is it's, oh, we need to do a 5k, we need to do an annual gala, we need to whatever, because it's somewhere expected from them, or they see their quote unquote competitors doing something like that. Um, and again, that's all fine and well, but what I always like to think of events as a bridge. So something should be leading people there and there should be a place for them to go after they leave. So when you're at the event, what are you telling them to do? There should be a call to action, whether it's to join your email list or to sign up for this next thing, to buy this next thing, tell a friend, whatever it is. But if you're just going out there having an event and calling it a day, then you're really not going to serve your, you may raise the money, but you really haven't captured that audience in the best way possible. And you're kind of just gonna spin your wheels um, and not really get anywhere. So just have a, have a strategy and a metric for something to know what you have to measure it against. Is that a success? Is this, where's the room for improvement because we did or did not reach this goal? Great, that's really useful. Back a few steps. Let's say mm -hmm. a listener is going, this needs doing in my community. Mm -hmm. I want C Chris, Chris, Christy to help. Sorry, I'll mm -hmm. rephrase that and edit it out. Mm -hmm. um, I want Christy to help. I've got this really great idea or I want somebody like Christy to help or maybe I need to focus on this. Maybe the question they are asking themselves is, what would Christy do? So that they're passionate about the cause. Mm -hmm. they, they're part of them is thinking, shall I get... Um, it's got to be non-profit, maybe it's a charity, maybe it's a social enterprise, but I want to do something. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Yeah, the, the blessing and the curse of working with small organizations is pretty much everything I do is custom built. <laughs> um, so I do have people that come to me with very specific, I am launching a website, I have a new product idea, I am, you know, launching a charity fundraiser, whatever it is. Then I have people who, I think I kind of want to know this, or I, we have a for-profit and we want to incorporate a giving component. So that's always stuff I'm happy to talk to people about as well. Um, I love systems and strategy. And so part of just getting people organized, helping them figure out a strategy, I have a client who she's putting together a um, kind of a self-growth tool to help people meet their goals. And so she came to me with the idea, she'd already done a pilot program. Um, and she said, okay, I think this is where I want to go next. And, you know, and so it just took having that outside perspective to be able to push back and ask questions that maybe she hadn't thought about because we're always so close to our project project and saying, okay, I think this is where we need to go next. This is, I think just, you need to not worry about this for now. Let's talk about a website. Let's talk about a sales system. Let's talk about have you vetted it to the degree that it needs to be? Do you have testimonials? And so I think we can all use um, kind of that other voice, that third party that just looks at something so objectively and says, you know, let's look at it from this perspective. So I love doing that for other people and people have certainly done that for me. I am in a mastermind. I have two business mentors. Um, I have an accountability partner, just all these things because I want people doing that for me, I want them to look and say, here's kind of the holes as to where I see them here. This is really good. Have you thought about this? And so even from a business perspective, whether it's talking somebody through um, their event or product or whatever it may be, sometimes the best thing we can do is just get that outside perspective from somebody who doesn't hold it as closely as we do. That's brilliant advice. Brilliant advice. Um, how can people find out more about you? Yeah, um, so my website is signify.solutions, which is a little um, unusual because it's not a .com or a .co or a .uk. Um, it's signify.solutions, so I think that will probably be in your show notes. And then I'll also give you a link um, that will send people to a page where there's all kinds of things if they want to sign up for. I have an e-course, I have a marketing plan template, I have a launch marketing checklist, and 
um, a checklist for launch marketing or for marketing ideas in general. So there's lots of little things that I want to help people through. And I think the benefit of me working with small organizations so often is I know how to do things in a scrappy way. So hopefully these will help you no matter what stage of business you're at. And I would endorse all that because I've downloaded them. I found you on social media. I think it was Facebook. We yeah. came across one another and uh, I, you have my email list and uh, I never get spammed. And oh, um, the group is really active. The group's quite active. So, um, yeah, and I think, group. There's um, a lot of good people in there. There's some re some amazing projects going on, so worth yeah. dropping on uh, and, and signing up for those free gifts. It's really worthwhile and Thank a good you. model to copy uh, if you're into content marketing, I think. Fabulous. Yes. Thank you what so much. Plans? I appreciate it. What are the plans? Any plans for the next few years? Oh, goodness. A few years. I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Tell us um, about next week or by the okay. end of the year. Yes, we've got some good things going on. Um, right now is just about me really, uh, I'm actually doing a series on content marketing right now, funny enough. So I'm kind of regrouping a little bit over the summer. So right now we do a weekly blog post this summer. It will be just a monthly blog post. It'll be a larger blog post that people can really dive into. But I think by nature, people sort of take it lighter on the summer with family vacations and holidays and things like that. So we'll do that and then dig back in in the fall. Um, and then, you know, long-term plan will be, I know not everybody will be able to afford one-on-one -on -one services. So I will be working on some digital downloads and products that will help people in small ways at a more affordable price point. So they can either get an idea of what I do and how I work um, and my skill set, or it may just be they don't have the budget right now, which I completely understand as well and would never fault anybody from that. So that is, that's the big long-term goal. Um, but yeah, just the more people I can help, the better. Okay, they're the serious questions all over and done with. Now okay. for a bit of fun. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether they have these in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> do you pronounce scone, scone, or do you not have any idea what I'm talking scones. about? I love scones. In fact, I told you I was in the UK. Um, I was in England, Scotland, and Ireland last month in, in March. And I definitely had my fill of scones. And what order did you have them in? Cream with the jam on top or jam with yeah. the cream on top? Okay. Um, I did the cream with the jam on top. We loved clotted cream. It tastes definitely different over here. I have a friend that has a tea shop that's actually a social enterprise here, and she has like an afternoon tea every day. And her clotted cream is a little different in the couple places I've had it here. I would definitely say it's in the UK. It just seemed really hard to get home on the plane, <laughs> but it was outstanding. Which is the best or can't you say? Okay. The it face says it all. Yeah, it, it was definitely your guys. Yeah. Yeah, it's it the was, right answer. It was, yeah, almost like ice cream consistency, except not cold. It was fantastic. Mm. We actually had got one, picked one up in the airport in Dublin because we were flying out from there just to have one to eat on the plane on the way home. Oh, cool. Oh, amazing. Um, the other question is Gary Vaynerchuk. Yes, no, mm -hmm. never heard of. Um, yes, I think he's a super smart man. Um, I follow him sort of at arm's length only because I do feel like a lot of what he says is great, but it is more advanced than a lot of my clients. And so I try and, you know, part of my role is distilling down information that's more actionable for the small organizations with just a few employees. So those are kind of the people I tend to listen to and take courses from and all of that. So I think he's incredibly smart. He's certainly successful and done well, and he knows his stuff. But Sometimes when you're looking at people that are up to that level, it's hard to distill the information down enough to make it practical for really small organizations. So that's what I try and do and try and listen to those types of voices as well. I think that's a really good point because he's sort of one minute he's on Instagram, then he's promoting Twitter, then he's talking mm -hmm. about uh, Snapchat. And you're thinking, but, but there are only 24 hours in the day, Gary, yeah. give me a break. Yes, yes. And somebody's got to return my email. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, great. And the last question, which I usually ask, first of all, tea, coffee, decaffeinated, iced coffee? Okay, let's see. Well, first of all, I grew up in the South, so it was iced tea. So all my early years, I had only had iced tea. So one time, I remember the first time I went to New York, um, in the early 2000s, maybe 2001, so I'm dating myself here, but I ordered tea and they brought me hot tea. And so I was like, oh, this is a thing. I have to ask up here in the North for hot iced hot tea. So definitely grew up iced tea. Then I switched to hot tea. Um, coffee is still prob probably my favorite. Um, however, I think they all have their place and I am definitely an Earl Grey addict and drink my fair share throughout the um, trip last month as well. So I love Earl Grey. I, that was the main souvenir I purchased was tea in all three countries. Um, but yeah, I love tea as well. And then my friend that I mentioned has um, the tea shop here. I went with her to Darjeeling, India, where the girls that she works with are. And so we were able to tour the tea plantation and have like a fresh tasting right out of the field and all of that stuff. So those kinds of experiences definitely helped me not only like it, but understand and appreciate it a lot more as well. So that's I'm definitely becoming more of a tea person. Great stuff. Great stuff. Thank you so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate all you're doing. Thank you very much.